This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. So today's speaker is Rick Reitmeyer from Adobe Systems, and he'll be talking about the ActionScript virtual machine that he designed there. And actually, when I sat down to read the newspaper this morning over breakfast, if I could get the overhead camera, please, the front page of the business section has an interesting article on Adobe Systems. <laughs> Can you switch to the overhead camera? And basically, um, Adobe has, is the first company to get the government's recognition from a platinum level of environmental. Okay, I guess we're not going to get the over. Do you have it? Okay, good. So for having a platinum level of environmental um, amenities in their building. And this is just kind of neat. So if you get a chance, I'll leave this up here. You can take a look. But some of the technology they put in is real-time electric meters that monitor electricity use and measure savings. And it also is aware of if there's any kind of um, inefficiencies in how electricity is being used. And they're also recycling 95% of their solid waste, ranging from the paper and cardboard to the kitchen grease. And it's all getting either composted or recycled. So an interesting application of technology to a, to a good purpose. Also. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to give you an idea of what this talks are that we have aligned for next quarter. So um, that's the summary of this quarter. So for winter quarter next year, we're going to be having Anup Gupta speaking for Microsoft and Dave Patterson from Berkeley. How many of you are familiar with the Hennessy and Patterson architecture books? OK. <laughs> So a lot of people being at Stanford have met Hennessy, but have not met Patterson. So this will be an interesting chance to get to meet him and hear him talk. Then Kristen McDonald from Life, Lime Life will be talking. And this is a cell phone applications company. And then Phil Levis from Stanford is going to talk about Tiny OS 2.0. And this is related to the uh, wireless sensor networks and an operating system for it. Then Fabian Kloss from PASMI, Ian Hugh Marta from Viewpoints Research Institute, Morris Hurley from Brown University, and Alan Wong will all be speaking with more details to be coming soon. And just to remind everyone who doesn't know about 380 and the way it works, if you're taking the class for credit now, you can keep coming back to E380. You're welcome to take the seminar as many times as you'd like for credit. And you can also feel free to just attend a seminar here or there as the topics interest you. So today, Rick Reitmeyer is here. And to give you an idea of his background, he has a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics from the University of Waterloo. And he's worked at a variety of companies, including Macromedia, Cognigen, Brio, Scribe, Exocom, and Nortel. And he's currently a senior scientist at Adobe Systems. He's been working on the Adobe Flash Player's active script or action script virtual machine. And in addition to just having the um, streaming video and audio capabilities in Adobe Flash Player, they also have a scripting language in it called ActionScript. And so Rick Reitmeyer has developed a virtual machine for the ActionScript. So he'll be talking to us about the design and implementation of that. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eileen. And uh, I really appreciate the chance and the opportunity to talk to all of you here. You have some great presentations. Uh, that have happened already, and uh, I hope this one gives you something, um, teaches you something, and, and you learn a little bit about what we're doing, and, um, and also uh, gives you some of the background of how we use what some of the research that happens here and how it gets applied in industry. So uh, with that, I'll jump into the presentation. Um, I am a senior scientist at Adobe. Uh, I have been working on the ActionScript virtual machine and this particular version uh, 
for a number of years now. And um, I have some marketing slides that are at the beginning of my presentation. And they're very flashy with lots of color and everything else. And then my slides are the latter half of the presentation. So they tend to be monochrome and not so exciting. But uh, I have to apologize up front because I gratuitously use PowerPoint animation to move things about. No spinning cubes or anything, but uh, I'll just warn you up front. So close your eyes if you, if you cringe at that sort of thing. Um, Adobe, I'll start off with my marketing slides then. Adobe is a $2.5 billion company. We have uh, 5,000 roughly employees um, after the merger with Macromedia. And they've been around for about 20 years or now, so, so a fairly large company. There's uh, labs in San Jose, that's the headquarter. There's also a San Francisco lab, which is the Macromedia um, office, and that's where I'm located, actually. And there's some other labs in Ottawa and Seattle, et cetera. Uh, something that not too many people know is that we have both the Flash Player, which is uh, a little less apparent in your lives, or maybe apparent, depends on how you look at it, um, some advertising that, that ends up going through the Flash Player. And there's also the uh, PDF Reader, which is uh, more visible to most people. And we have about a half a billion um, platforms, or half a billion users uh, installed on either machines or devices or a mixture of both. So there's a broad reach of our platform in the industry. And a lot of that is in uh, browsers, but there's also a fair amount in mobile and um, disconnected or, or connected devices, but portable devices like cell phones, et cetera. And, uh, and a fair amount of it is just not visible to the end user. So. Um, our application developers are actually covering a large sweep from, from the browser, um, the web space, all the way down to mobile phones. And we have roughly 100, I think 100 million there in the mobile space. On the plug-in side of things, this is where the Flash Player resides. And, and I'll be discussing the Flash Player throughout the presentation, uh, leaving behind the Acrobat plug-in. Uh, on the plug-in side, the uh, Flash Player is a downloadable entity. It's about a megabyte or so, and most of the times it comes pre-installed inside the browser. Um, you're not even aware it's there. There is a full um, engine in there, runtime engine, which can run bytecode. A uh, typical language that users use uh, is ActionScript that gets compiled into the bytecodes and executed. And I'll talk more into the architecture as we get in there. There's also a graphics engine in there used for rendering um, images and also moving and animating things around. So um, you see a fair bit of that on the web. Um, a lot of it used for advertising, but some of it used for good too. Um, on, the, on the penetration side, it's interesting. These, these are some marketing slides here. And if you look, we have about uh, 90 or 96 percent uh, roughly coverage on desktop. So a very, very high high rate of uh, access through our platform. So that basically tells you that you could program for the Flash Player and have almost complete coverage inside web browsers. Another, some interesting facts too is that as we upgrade versions, um, the uptake rate is very, very high. So for example, if we look at the Flash Player 8 that was released uh, roughly a year ago, more than that, um, it takes typically less than a year for us to get full adoption of the latest player. And in this case, we, with the player, player 8, we, we managed to do it in less than a year. So it's very good. With uh, player 9, we're achieving a similar curve. So what this means for developers is if you write to a specific version of Flash, take advantage of all the latest and greatest features, you're pretty much guaranteed within a year that you can have that target platform running on almost every browser. Um, not too many companies can claim that. If you look at operating systems, for example, you're writing APIs, you have to be concerned with you know, the cycle of moving from NT to XP to you know, Vista now is the next one. So those are very, very long cycles. Ours are extremely short. You say, well, what, what drives all this stuff? Well, this is another great marketing slide. Um, wonderful curve here. Um, part of it is that we innovate within the player itself. So we add, add features inside the player. In this particular case, is demonstrating our, our video growth. So in player eight, we released uh, streaming video. We allowed content to be streamed out onto uh, the video player. And you can see that it's driven the, uh, the uptake rate 
uh, tremendously. Um, things like YouTube, uh, NBC, ABC, everyone's streaming out video now. It seems to be the hottest thing. And this is what's driving player adoption. What happens with our technology is if you don't have a particular version of the player and it's needed, you get a prompt that says, do you want to download the latest? You click, and seeing as the plugin's less than a meg, it usually is pretty quick, and we can um, download fairly fast. So users don't abort our, in our install, which is great. Uh, the other thing that's driving um, adoption, and this is more to the point of what I'll be talking about in the rest of the presentation, are these things called rich internet apps, or at least that's um, what our company would like to call them. Um, what they are is um, a trend towards moving away from static HTML pages. So if you think about a checkout application, you fill in a form, you click on a few things, and then you hit enter, and then it goes back to the server, and then brings up some more HTML, you kind of continue that process. With uh, these internet apps that are coming out there now, as an example, um, Google Finance is a good one, uh, Yahoo Maps, those kind of things where you're manipulating mouse, doing mouse movements, you're um, interacting with an application in real time, and it's not bringing up static HTML for you. It's actually rendering things dynamically on the fly. So there's some fancy fly-ins here that, that demonstrate these are the features of, of these apps. Um, content that's being updated, calculations being performed, some processing, heavy lifting happening on the client. And this is another characteristic that we're starting to see in, in the field and is driving adoption of our latest players. It's also proving something quite interesting that we'll talk about later, which is, well, as these applications are, are getting more complex, how do we handle that on the client side? The interesting point about all of this is that it's all being done with scripting languages. So if you think about it, doing all this heavy lifting with a scripting language sounds uh, very strange, but it's actually occurring in the industry right now. Um, there's some benefits to using a scripting language. One is they're very easy to actually start, start writing code with, very rapid development cycles, um, easy to prototype things and get things done. And if you look at the net, um, it's, they're everywhere. I mean, this, this is one of the reasons that they've taken off. If you think about Netscape and Internet Explorer, all the browsers, there's JavaScript engines in there, or uh, as uh, Microsoft calls it, JScript. So there's a JScript, which is a variant. They're all basically the same, um, same engines running inside the browsers. So these are the language, this is the language that you actually have to use if you want to build these types of applications. The same thing goes with the Flash Player. We have a variant called ActionScript which is essentially JavaScript. And um, it also is available in the player. So th these are the tools that you have right now, and this is what you have to use. The other side of it is uh, familiarity. The language itself, I'll, I'll give a little bit of an overview of the language, and then we'll talk about some of the more details, uh, some more details in it. Um, it looks very much like C and somewhat like Java, so it's very familiar to people. It's easy to get, get working in the language. Um, but there are some issues with it. And the, the biggest one being um, it is a dynamically typed language. It's uh, very free-flowing. So you can write code such as A plus B not knowing what A and B are. A can contain a number and B could contain a string and you add them together and you get some concatenation. Whereas what you really wanted was addition, for example. So your code will run perfectly fine, and uh, it continues to execute, but you may not get the result that you're expecting. So there's a, a lot of issues with that, and that's um, the safety and predictability aspect of, of using a scripting language. So there are trends now to, to move more toward um, type safety, for example, and these types of things, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. There's also a performance aspect. If we look at the A plus B example, um, not knowing what A is and not knowing what B is, we have to then figure out uh, if A is a string and B is a string, then do concatenation. If they're numbers, convert them to numbers, et cetera. So there's a fair amount of uh, control path flow that has to, to go through code to generate a result for that particular expression. And this, of course, is an inefficiency in the language. So there's a lot of opportunities here. And before I jump into how they're addressed, and, or how we address them at least, I, I want to give a bit of history. And I hope this slide, it looks a bit 
overwhelming, but I hope it actually disambiguates this whole, the whole business. Um, there are many versions of JavaScript, ActionScript, et cetera, floating around. Uh, if we look at the left, that's actually ECMA. ECMAScript is, if you think of that as a standards body, they write the, the, the standards for the scripting languages. Uh, Mozilla re Netscape were the first ones to come up with a, a JavaScript engine and in their early browser, and they still maintain it. Uh, their evolution of their engine has basically followed ec ECMAScript to some extent, kind of roughly step and foot. And, uh, but they're really driven by what's inside the browser. So if you think about how they're being used, it's HTML interaction, generating HTML, modifying it, manipulating it, and that sort of thing. Uh, and somewhat, you know, how to plug into the object model within the browser is, is kind of their, their scope, their world. Uh, Adobe, we also have our variant of JavaScript, which, oh, by the way, is trademark. So um, all these names are trademark. So uh, I think I need to say that before I say it, right? But anyway, um, ActionScript is our variant of a JavaScript-like language. And it also follows ECMAScript to some extent. Um, so we also started down the path with ActionScript 1.0. Um, we actually integrated portions of the language into the player in order to, at that time, essentially manage animation. If you think of uh, the origins of the Flash player, it's an animation engine. We have things in there about framing and controlling timing and, and generating graphics primitives and manipulating them. And ActionScript was a way that our users could actually uh, tie in scripting language or, or language to tie into the graphics and, and control them at a finer granularity. Um, ActionScript 2 was realization that, uh, within our, our company that, well, we need more than just, a, just that. We actually have to bring the language up to a fuller fruition. So we added classes and typing, et cetera. And then Action 3 is the latest release of ActionScript where um, we add exception handling uh, and we add a few other things in there that takes it to the next evolution. That was released in Flash Player 9. So we have all, a couple of variants floating around. Then we have uh, Internet Explorer. And at the end point, we're all sort of converging to the same thing, which is the the addition for spec. ActionScript 3.0 with the Flash Player is released now. JavaScript 2.0 is not released yet. And the spec is still in, I think it's final revs, but it continues to evolve. So talking a little bit about the language now, we'll back up and uh, talk a bit about the characteristics of the language and then what that means to the runtime system and, and how we evolved it. Um, if we look at JavaScript or ActionScript as a language, it's uh, prototype-based, meaning that there are no classes at all. It's based on making copies of instances. So you add properties or slots uh, or information to your objects, and then when you need to make a, an instance or duplicate object, you just simply do a copy, and, and then that resolves into another object, another, another instance, and then you modify it as you like. Um, this is a, a concept that was developed, I think here actually at Stanford, um, with the self language. And um, that greatly influenced the design of JavaScript, which was originally done by Brendan, Brendan Eich at Netscape and built into the Netscape browser. Um, the other piece of it is that these slots are, can be contained values or they can contain code underlying them. So when you say O dot, Foo, for example, it may actually execute some code and return a value for you, which is a little bit different than standard languages. Um, if we move on to an example, this is what the language looks like, very simple thing. Um, and if you look at the code on top there, var my object equals an object. It's just object creation. I assign a property on a slot, which is value, object.value, and then it's a string. We can assign any arbitrary thing. Um, there's this little anomaly in the middle here. It says add property, and that's an action script-ism. Um, 
JavaScript and ActionScript are a little bit different in self in that you have to explicitly say this particular slot is going to execute code to produce a value. Otherwise, if you just access the, the slot itself, you'll get the, the value return, which happens to be the function. So in this case, we have to give it kind of a little nudge saying, no, no, I want you to execute the code and then return the value. So that's what this add property does. And here we're just creating, creating a slot called foo and some function behind it and then execute it. A few things to notice about the code is there is no, no type information whatsoever anywhere in there. It's just free, free form, free flowing as I talked about. And the other thing is that the trace at the end there is just emitting the value. So it's fairly straightforward stuff. Uh, it was a setter. So we have, you can back it by setting a value. So if you said my object dot foo, you could actually set it to something else and it would trigger that function to get called. So that was great for our customers. They loved it. You know, ActionScript was great. They could do whatever they want. But of course, they, this came out in, in ActionScript 1 timeframe, which is around just before Java really took off, C++ got popular. And as object-oriented languages started becoming very mainstream, our customers started clamoring for that feature. Um, so they said, well, why don't you add classes? And we said, okay. ECMAScript was coming out, uh, updating the standards, supporting classes in the ECMAScript standards. So we decided, well, why don't we take what they've defined in the standard and bring it and migrate it into the player. So we came up with uh, ActionScript 2. And ActionScript 2 was support for classes and for type annotation. And the class support was added in a very interesting way. It was actually done without changing the runtime whatsoever. So a very, very brilliant guy in-house, Gary Grossman, came up with the idea of taking uh, from the compiler side, just compiling straight down to byte codes that could be um, interpreted in the current runtime system. So using class as like syntactic sugar with a prototype-based model hanging off it on the background underneath. And that's where ActionScript 2 came in. So it was also nice, too, because we could claim that we had picked up more of um, ECMAScript 4, which is, again, the standards, standards compliance. Um, and the explicit types were interesting in that our customers were, again, if we look at A plus B as an example, they were adding um, A as a number, 5, B as a string. And adding them together, the runtime would work. and later their code wouldn't quite function. So having uh, type annotations onto the assignments made life a lot easier for our customers. At compile time, we could actually catch those types of errors and then present to the user, and then they can decide whether to do something or, or not. Kind of revving the language again. Uh, same example, but using classes this time. So you'll note that our annotation of a string on the slot value is there. Uh, a slightly different syntax for the add property, which was uh, a keyword called get now added. So get means execute the function foo. That backs it. Um, slightly different notation for creating the object. And you'll note, again, type notation there so the compiler can do everything. Uh, and then the assignments, and they all work the same. So. All of a sudden, we have classes, and life is great. Now, the interesting thing at this point was that our customers started asking for even more, of course. And uh, once we added classes, they started writing more and more code, which, which proved interesting and gave us a whole set of different problems. So stepping back and looking at our workflow, if you think about um, scripting languages, they typically have a compiler built into the engine, the runtime engine. And you can actually generate strings on the fly, compile them, and run them dynamically. Uh, our particular system didn't allow for that, the Flash Player, and still doesn't allow for that. Flash Player contains only the runtime engine itself. In this case, it in contains our simple interpreter. And uh, for reasons of keeping the Flash Player small and light, we want to keep things under one megabyte. So we keep everything uh, very, very tight. And adding the interpreter into the engine would have just bloated the size tremendously. 
So our runtime system only contains a simple interpreter. So we have the compiler up front, which is in a separate tool set, uh, compile down the bytecode, and the bytecode is wrapped up in a package called a, a Swift. And the Swift contains not only the bytecodes, but also codes that perform uh, animation and rendering. So there are also graphic primitives contained within that. The bytecode is a stack-based machine, at least uh, at this time. Um, and it's also kind of interesting because the bytecode started off, as I talked about earlier, um, tying these animation primitives together. So controlling, say, an object moving across the screen, for example. We had primitives that actually dealt with that movement. Uh, and we also have primitives or bytecodes operations inside uh, the engine that deal with, say, um, lower level actions like pushing onto a stack. So we had this mismatch of, um, or discrepancy between the level of abstraction that we had in our bytecode. And it was interesting in that it allowed for certain things to execute very quickly, but other things would just fall off terribly. Um, it also made it very difficult to manage the code. We had um, basically one big switch statement with lots of cases in it. Um, we had littered throughout that um, checks for types, checks for everything under the sun, security checking, everything, all in this big switch statement. So it started to get unwieldy, and this is around the Flash Player 8 time frame when we started looking at this and saying, well, we actually need to do something, and we need to change things fairly dramatically. So what we found is that we're starting to hit this performance limit of what we can actually do within, the, within our runtime system. We are starting to see customers write more and more complex code. They're writing um, code that looks more and more like what you'd find in the client on the desktop. Bigger applications, more sophisticated, um, packaging up things. And they're, they're still writing that in ActionScript, which is great for us. Um, and starting to see a componentization, too, of pieces of code being sold off separately as a, as a module. So these, these are presenting interesting uh, um, difficulties for us because um, as you start plugging all of this code together, if it doesn't run fast enough, it, it's pretty poor for a customer experience. So we decided, well, we need to look at something fairly dramatic to get the performance increase that, that is substantial enough to kind of take us to the next level. And this is where the AVM2 project came about. And the AVM2, or ActionScript Virtual Machine 2, um, was started in-house as an underground project by, uh, by a very bright gentleman by the name of Edwin Smith, um, the architect of the project. And then a few other people kind of joined in and, and played around with it too while we were working on it. Um, and it eventually grew to the point where um, we were executing and running byte code significantly faster than, than what could be done in the current player. So uh, we finally got buy-in and then moved in to start producing it. So it addresses performance, which, which was the biggest killer at that point. Um, and also it maintained backward compatibility. That one's a bit of a cheat because uh, the way it did that was we didn't even try and maintain compatibility in the AVM2. We just said forget it. <laughs> and we uh, designed it from scratch and thought about ActionScript 3 or the ECMA, ECMAScript Edition 4 only. Focused on that, tried to get that code um, executing as quickly as possible. Um, and then, of course, because we started from scratch, it allowed us to do things um, very revolutionary that couldn't have been done with this old code that was laying around. This is another marketing slide here, but uh, it's great in that it shows that there's two virtual machines, the AVM1 and the AVM2, and that was uh, our solution to maintaining backward compatibility. Not elegant, but it was functional. <laughs> um, the, the other thing about this marketing slide is there's a, a couple of points here about ActionScript 3.0, um, not only supporting all the things I've talked about before, classes, uh, also exception handling was thrown in there, uh, native types, so support for real, like just integers, support for Boolean and, and these, um, these types of things. Also, XML being promoted to uh, its own um, type, which is rather interesting. So 
doing that to ourselves, what, did, what problems did it cause? Well, the biggest thing was uh, keeping size down. Because we decided at a, as a hybrid approach, having both PMs, we had to make sure that we didn't grow the flash player too, too much too quickly. Um, because size is always a, a huge factor within the company and still is, which, which is great because that means that the download size is small, code is compact, engineers are constantly aware of adding a few lines of code, which is a, a really, it creates a really interesting dynamic within the, within the group. Um, also, because of this disparity, we, I talked about the byte codes. We have low level byte codes like a push and we have high level byte codes like get time or move an object. As soon as we started to design the byte code at a lower level that was agnostic of our uh, surrounding, our environment, we ran into difficulties in that, well, this one-op code that moved or got the time or moved the object all of a sudden exploded into a bunch of op codes that made a system call out to some library. So trying to find that right balance between um, what gets pushed in the library and, and what lands in, in our lap was, was pretty difficult without blowing out the byte code. So we wanted to take current applications, compile them with our new system, and make sure that you know, we didn't see a two times um, size jump. Uh, and that proved pretty, pretty difficult. Um, startup speed, too, was another one that was uh, highly, highly uh, important. If you look at the architecture of the Flash Player, it's actually a streaming machine. So as we get video, as we get code, uh, animation sequences, before we download the entire thing, we can actually start executing all of it. And um, this is still maintained in the current Flash player as of today. So we can actually start executing code before we have a, a complete program in place. Um, Quick question is, sure. did, the one meg, did, you, did you go from one meg for, for one virtual machine to one meg for two virtual machines? Well, we kind of blew the budget a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we stayed within it, roughly. I mean, if you look at the current player now, I think we're about 1.2, two and a half or three somewhere around there. So it's not like we doubled. And, and that was sort of the, the cap that we placed on it to make sure that we just didn't blow the whole budget out. Um, I think everyone would have been happy to stay around the one meg mark, but it was just, it was too difficult. As you'll see, when I start talking about some of the, the pieces that we put in there, you'll, you'll realize why it's, why it's that big. Um, so startup speed is vital. The, we have this streaming engine that we have to maintain. Um, and to hit the performance targets that we wanted to hit, we had to look at pretty drastic changes. We couldn't just take the interpreter and tweak it, uh, come up with a new bytecode and make a really fast interpreter. That just wouldn't have worked. So we had to start looking at just-in-time technology, jitting technology, uh, and doing native compilation within the player itself. And this poses its own problems with Sparta startup time. If you think about it, you get a bunch of code that you've downloaded. If you now have to JIT it before you can start executing, you have this period of time in between when you're JITting where nothing necessarily is, is going on. You can't run the code. So w we had to come up with some interesting ways of, um, of managing that. The other piece that came out of that was garbage collection. If we wanted to operate at the speeds that we were thinking of, which is an order of magnitude faster than we were currently, but we had to seriously look at our garbage collector. We started to see in some of the benchmarks garbage collection becoming an issue in the Flash Player 8 time frame. So we knew that once we capped the barrier down on the execution runtime, the GC would have been the next thing that we have to nail. So we started early and, and attacked the GC from the front. The design of the AVM2 centered around the bytecode. So we could have kind of started either end, um, you know, anywhere, but uh, we, we decided to start with the bytecode and then work out backward to the compiler and then into the, the, the JIT. So the bytecode really being the focal point um, forced us into many decisions. Um, one thing we, again, we wanted to keep size down, so we had to make sure that everything was very compact. Um, and the system we came up with is fairly standardized. We have a constant table, we have uh, exception tables, and uh, type and description information about our typing system as we, as we download it. Uh, it's also a stack-oriented machine. And we have 
operations for object creation, slot access, and a little, something a little bit different that you won't find in, in virtual machines, uh, property search. Because of the dynamic nature of the language, we actually have to do lookups on a method or, or lookups on a slot before we can actually go execute it or go query the value of it, make sure it actually exists. Because in the language, you can actually add slots dynamically as you go around. And the compiler wouldn't necessarily know about it. Uh, on the runtime side, uh, one of the big things we ended up doing, which is, is pretty apparent that you want to do, is separate uh, verification from execution. This means that when we get the code down, we do a pass through it, making sure that it's correct, and we stamp the code as correct, and then we allow our execution engines to operate against it. The other thing that we ended up doing was uh, tightening up the interpreter. Of course, it becomes leaner. How yep. do you mix the separation of verification? from execution with the quick startup? Do you do a verification pass as you're running? Um, that's a great question. It's a lead into to what I'll talk about in a second. Okay. Um, and then if I don't answer it in the next couple of slides, I'll come back to it and I'll bring it up again. Um, we have a two-pass JIT engine in there. So um, our compiler, and I'll talk about the details a little bit, and the GC we revamped too. So here's another slide about the, uh, actually the colors are quite terrible. Um, this is an engineer slide, it's not a marketing slide, so. <laughs> and I think I'll blame Edwin on it, I think he did it. <laughs> but anyway, it, it kind of gives you all the pieces that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, and let me just talk about the, the top two at the beginning because they might not, might not be apparent. Swift is our, our package for how we hold all of the, um, the primitives, uh, the operations, the uh, graphics utilities, that, that's the package that gets downloaded. It's like the EXE plus a bunch of DLLs kind of wrapped up together. The ABC is actually the bytecode stream itself. So these are the operations that the stack-based machine I was talking about. And then all the other pieces are, are things that we, we had to put in place. So we'll first talk about the garbage collector. Um, the, the garbage collector was rather interesting because it came about, as I talked about, we identified the GC as an early beast that we had to tackle. And um, the GC was, um, the project was started roughly at the same time as the AVM2, maybe a little bit earlier. And it actually came out a lot faster than the, the AVM, the virtual machine. So we had an opportunity to plug in the, the garbage collector in an earlier version of the, the player, which we did. So the garbage collector actually went out in Flash Player 8. And that was a good thing because it got fully tested and, and uh, driven then in that product. <coughs> Excuse me. But it also meant that we completely decoupled from the AVM2. So there, as you write code, there may be a tendency to sort of wind things in and not quite know about it. So having this thing decoupled completely, uh, having it go out of a separate release actually decoupled that, that thing entirely, which was wonderful. Um, it's a standard library that's independent of everything else. It supports um, new delete, so if you want to manage your own memory, you go ahead. Also, it supports new and, and free by GC. Um, the, one of the other things that proved really interesting was uh, debugging aids within the GC library itself. The, if you look at the library, it's not that much code, as most GC libraries are not that big, but the complexity of them is tremendous. And trying to debug and decipher what's going on is, is quite a nightmare. So the more debugging aids you can throw into that type of code, the better off you are in the end. And we found this out as we were developing it. We realized, oh, we want to put a lot of debugging in, but we never realized how much debugging we need. So we just kept putting in more and more debugging as we kept going. And even in the end, we were still putting in more debugging. Profiling was one of the last things that went in there, and it would have been great to have that actually early on to, to see what's going on with memory and as it's being consumed. So interesting lesson there. Um, the GC itself is a, a, an interesting blend. We have, um, it's an incremental conservative mark and sweep. Um, incremental meaning that we can actually interrupt it anytime we need to, which is highly important for our application. As I said, we're running a streaming, we're typically running streaming um, applications that are coming in. We have things that are highly interactive. Someone clicks on a mouse, we don't want it hesitating doing a GC pass before we, we actually react. So having it being incremental is, is important. Um, conservative was just a choice that um, allowed us to not worry so much about how 
some of the team was programming. If we had a non-conservative collector, then we'd actually have to go in and have each programmer mark this is a particular pointer, <coughs> excuse me, and, um, and manage the memory that way. With a conservative collector, what we're essentially doing is treating memory as a, a random stream of bits. And the, it's up to the GC or the garbage collector to decide what's a pointer. And then if it's not quite sure, it'll choose, it'll err on the side of conservatism and choose it as a pointer and then treat it that way. So before we um, free something, we'll make sure there's absolutely no bits in memory that look like a pointer to that thing. Uh, the other aspect of it is uh, ref counting. So um, reference counting, for, for those of you not familiar with these techniques, reference counting is if I have two objects and one of them starts pointing to another object, then I would increment the reference count of that object and do so continually as other objects start pointing to it. Now, once you start uh, freeing those pointers off, the ref count will start dropping. When it hits zero, you say, okay, the object's free to go. With deferred ref counting, well, the problem with doing ref counting is that there's a lot of overhead, um, especially with um, objects that are freed and stored very quickly. So if you have things laying on the stack and it's only, you know, created on the stack on the fly and then released very quickly, it's just like a temporary object, you have a lot of ref counting overhead associated with that. So what we do with our deferred ref counting algorithm is we actually don't do ref counting until it actually moves, the pointers move off the stack and into heap memory. So only heap to heap accesses actually end up being ref counted. And this is a, actually a pretty significant speed up. The other thing that the ref counting does, which is rather interesting is, if you look at GC activity, it's typically a sawtooth. You have a lot of allocations and then a lot of freeze. And a lot of allocations, a lot of freeze. Freeze happen when the GC is running and the allocations happen when the code's running. Um, and this plays havoc, especially on a system like ours, where sometimes you have constrained memory devices. So having things ref counted and being able to free them before um, a typical cycle occurs or the typical sweep happens is uh, extremely convenient and valuable. So we see more of a, we still get a bit of a sawtooth, but it's flattened out. We have these little cycles that in between when the, when the ref counting objects disappear. Well, the sawtooth, you end up consuming a lot of memory. So your memory growth looks like this, and then it'll drop off, and then it'll go up, and then it'll drop off. So there's a lot of um, resources that get hammered. Um, typically, when we're allocating, we allocate a chunk of memory from the OS, and then we start divvying it up for memory internally, and then another chunk from the OS. Every time we hit the OS to get more memory, it slows us down. And a lot of times, too, the OS can simply run out of memory, and then we're dead. So being able to throttle that and not ask the OS so many times for, for the memory um, gives us a benefit. So we kind of chop off the, the peaks of the, the sawtooth. How could you free it if, if you're not doing the ref counting? It's got to <coughs> say it's got a reference from the stack, mm -hmm. and you're not doing the GC that looks to, for the reference of the stack. How do you know you can free it? I mean, it seems like you might free something that's pointing to from the stack. With this well, we, we scan the stack actually too. So we scan the stack and registers also. So we need to look at what we call temporary space also to ensure that it's not, not actually there. Very good point though. Uh, <coughs> next piece is the verifier. And this guy um, is really the, the entry point for actually executing all the code. So verification consists of at least our verifier symbolically executing all the byte codes in the instruction stream. <coughs> and as you're symbolically executing it, you're tracking a couple of things. You're, well, you're tracking where you are, and then you're also tracking um, the types of data that you've seen and that you're producing and placing on the stack. So you have a virtual copy of everything that would go on should you execute the code at, at a later point. And when you do that, you get a couple of things that you can check for. One is make sure that your instruction pointer doesn't go haywire. So you're not branching out in the middle of nowhere. You're not landing off code and that sort of thing. And the other thing is that when you do um, branch to somewhere, that particular location where you're branching, you make sure that all the types or all the various branches that connect to that point, uh, the types are all aligned. You don't want uh, 
various types coming in on a, on a branch point. So for example, um, if you have a type of an integer sitting on a stack at the one branch point and then a number uh, on another type and you merge, you, know, you get some difficulty. Or even worse, if your stacks are misaligned coming off the, the branch points. Um, so the other thing we can do while we're doing this verification is we can also do, uh, well, we can't do the early binding, but what we can do is have a look at, at, well, let me back up a little bit and talk about early binding. Early binding means that at a point in the code where I'm going to do a lookup for a slot, like foo, for example, on an object, I have to check that it's actually there before I go execute the code that's behind it. Early binding means that I do the, the lookup for it dynamically while the, the verifier is running symbolically the code and actually see that that instruction uh, pointer is known to be a certain address at that point. So I know where the code is. It's already been loaded and the object's already been bound to, uh, the, the method's already been bound to the object. So I know the address that I need to jump to. So early binding allows you to actually just put the call in directly. The verifier doesn't let us do that, but it gives us hints that it can be done during the verification process. On the interpreter front, very simple interpreter, we're stack oriented. We didn't do anything fancy at this um, uh, stage. We didn't do a threading interpreter or anything like that. Which, mm -hmm. Back on the verifier slide, was that when you would have talked about how you do the early pass verification without? The next slide. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also have an encoding. Uh, for the for the instruction or for the values that are sitting on the stack, because we are, we are a dynamically typed language, types can change. We don't know exactly what's on the stack until we we hit it and we're running the code. So we have an encoding um, that we place on the stack that contains um, the the information about the type and also the information about what it is and, and where it's located. So possibly a pointer or for small integers, we encode the value directly. Um, so all the values are boxed there. And we, they have to get unboxed when we actually operate on them. For example, if it's a string, we have to dereference the pointer and go out to it. If it's an integer, we have to unload the integer out of the, out of the atom and then decode it and operate against it. So it's fairly expensive doing all that. But um, there's not much choice anyway. We also execute directly out of the verified bytecode. So once the verifier stamps the buffer as being verified, we execute directly in there and we don't have a copy. We also don't modify any of the bytecodes too. And the final piece is that the just-in-time compiler. So this is the big one. And we have a couple of passes that happen here. One, the first pass happens in tandem with the verifier. So as the verifier is running, we're emitting an intermediate representation. Um, this is a, a three-tuple form. So we have a, a operands which point to in other instructions. Um, and it's, it looks similar to, it's very close to a machine level actually. So we have an add operation, we have subtract, et cetera, things like that. So fairly low level and it allows us to then quickly do the next jump which is the, the second pass and jump straight to machine code. During this generation of the intermediate representation, we can do the early binding. So as the verifier is running, it's found out that there is a particular method at this address. And now as we generate the intermediate re representation, we can say, okay, just call directly to that address rather than doing a lookup again. So that's, that's where that comes in. Um, we also can do a number of optimization, constant folding where if we have two constants being added together, we can detect that uh, four plus four and then we just put in the value eight rather than doing the addition. Uh, copy and constant propagation. Similar, if we see a constant in an expression, we just bring the constant through. Um, if it's uh, x equals y and z equals x, we know that equals y, we'll bring um, z equals y into the expression. Also common sub-expression, we do the same sort of replacement for full expression. So if we have something a plus b plus c plus d, and we see the same expression further down in the instruction stream, we'll actually use the original generated um, expression again, won't duplicate it. 
a lot of these uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of these uh, expressions get generated when you're doing pointer arithmetic. So in our original bytecode, as we're generating the, the, the bytecode, it is fairly compact and it looks good. But when you start accessing real values in memory, you start calling procedures, you find there's a lot of redundancy in there, a lot of things that can be replaced. So the CSE engine is actually um, fairly busy doing a lot of that activity. Again, this is a single sweep over the bytecode happening during verification. So it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. I don't know if, how many people are doing that. The next pass that happens is we run over the intermediate code and we generate from there direct to, um, direct to native. So we have a hand-coded instruction selection algorithm where um, you know, based on the architecture we're on and based on other criteria, we'll map a intermediate representation instruction or mirror instruction into uh, a machine instruction. We also do register allocation at that point. And the register allocator is a linear scan register allocation. Actually, it's based on linear scan register allocation by Paletto. And um, very interesting algorithm in that we uh, can do it linearly in time. We don't have to do uh, a large search. Usually, I think some of these algorithms require a search over a large tree. And we can actually do it using uh, time frame windows in time. So the way this algorithm works, if you see an instruction as a lifetime from, say, uh, instruction 4 all the way to instruction 24, we then just use the, the delta saying, well, this thing is live in instruction 20, for 20 instructions. And then we can decide which register to, to populate based on the lifetimes. So we can do it as we're scanning directly into the code. We don't have to do any backtracking or anything else. So. A couple of questions. Maybe I'll take you first. Why do this just in time? I mean, a lot of this information can be determined ahead of time by the compiler, by whatever takes the source code and generates the, the bytecode. Like you could put hints in that this is a possible common sub-expression, and these are the constants. All this stuff. Why do it at runtime at all? Well, there in the it, it will do the the common sub-expression for things that are sitting. Um, that are bytecode based. So things that are sort of in, inside the interpreter or inside the bytecode system, you could do it. But where we find a big hit, for example, um, or big win for this, is when we're actually executing, uh, when we're doing the translation. So to, to give you an example, so if- the, Even the translation step, when you're translating to, to machine level, right. 886, um, you know, x86, Register operations. Right. You still know that translation ahead of time. You know what it's going to do on the target machine. Well, not for something like a fine property. If you look at a fine property opcode, that consists of a sequence of probably 15 mirror instructions, right? So if we have, say, multiple fine properties, and then we have these 45 mirror instructions, how do we know in between that? Where, where are the expressions that are common there? We, we couldn't push that to the front end because it didn't exist at that point. Only the fine properties were in the original, in the original bytecode stream. If that makes sense to you, is it? So it's the, these expressions are being generated as we do the translation. It's not something that was introduced earlier. It's being introduced at that point during the translation into the intermediate representation. Java VM, where the bytecode interpreter kind of doesn't change as often. There's more limitations there because you can't put that many hints into the bytecode format. But you have full control over the bytecode and the interpreter and the compiler. You have, you have full control over the entire chain. Right. So it seems like you can put, you can do all the analysis ahead of time and put that those hints into the bytecode. Well, we we could if we knew that the the bytecode was the, if we could do a direct mapping from bytecode to an instruction in machine code, but we can't. There's a level of abstraction there that is not visible in the front end of the compiler. And it's not visible in the bytecode itself. It's only visible when you go direct to the machine. So if you take a look at, um, uh, well, fine property may, may not be, but well, addition, for example, my right? My point is also that, like the part where you're saying, so the compiler is going to a certain level of abstraction. It's just dealing with bytecode. Right. But what I'm saying is that the thing which the JIT does, which takes the bytecode and translates it to machine code, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing you just unroll and stick it into the, the front end anyway. It would make it more complicated. 
the compiler more complicated, but that's sort of where the heavy lifting should be done is like the, the compiler. Well, you, you could argue that, but then if you push everything into the front end, you actually have a full size executable all the way out. And then you have to stream that down, right? translated down into right. the bytecode, but heavy lifting of the analysis would be done in, by the compiler because that's where everything's deterministic, everything is known at that point. Yeah, I, I think there's a slight disconnect. Maybe after the talk we can, we can sort it out, but I think there's a level of abstraction there that's just not available at the time that we, we compile into bytecode. That, that's kind of the missing thing. There was another... Yeah, I was, it, it was looking like this ought to happen in the developer's lab, but no, it's happening at runtime on the user's machine. Exactly, exactly. So maybe, maybe that's the, the disconnect. This, this compilation is occurring uh, within your browser. As, the, as we're, trans, we're translating from this bytecode that's being streamed down, and then in the browser itself, we're doing this compilation step. So, um, so the, during the second pass, uh, yeah, kind of went through that. We also um, eliminate any dead code that's that's not around, uh, that's not needed. We detect it and get rid of it. So the interesting too, uh, thing that we did here was um, we also did the Intel port first, so the IA32. And um, if you look at a, a bit of a, a fair amount of the literature, actually starts with uh, risk-based machines and they build JITs for that, and then they try and port to Intel. We went the other way because our market is actually, yeah, a lot of it is Intel. And it proved out to be very interesting because uh, the Intel architecture is a CISC based um, with a variable length encoding for their instructions. And also um, they have a limited number of registers. So we were actually constrained in a number of ways that we wouldn't have been if we had started with a risk based architecture. So when we did the Intel version first, it, it actually gave us kind of a leg up because then porting to PowerPC and then later to ARM actually proved really, really quite straightforward in a lot of ways. Um, the other thing is if you look at this slide too, you'll notice that, well, you know, this is, seems like a fairly light compiler. If you look at all the optimization that, that happens in a normal compiler before you generate code, you do a lot more than this. You'd have pages and pages full of optimizations happening. You have to remember once again, as the gentleman in the back pointed out, this has to happen on your client machine. So happening on the client machine and making sure that we have the right balance between how much we optimize and how fast the code uh, gets compiled to native machine code and how fast the startup time is and, and trying to find that right balance is extremely difficult. And this is kind of the point that we, well, this is the point that we arrived at to get that, that balance. Um, I'm sure you know, as we found, if you tuned one of these knobs, uh, for example, with the CSE engine, if we started to allow it to look back further um, in scope of how many instructions would be included and how far our search would be included, we found that that affected, even though we produced tighter code, it took too much time. So we ended up actually hurting our startup time in the end. So it's a very delicate balance, as, as probably compiler writers are all well too aware of. Is there any option for developers to sort of choose uh, how much, say, optimization you want to do? As, as an example, like let's take an ad, right. right? If you have an ad and it starts stuttering, like that's really not quite acceptable <coughs> at all. But you right. know, if you have, say, like a mapping application, you know, I'm sure we've all used Google Maps and sometimes it does stutter a little, and right. that's acceptable. So is there any ability for the programmer to kind of uh, set the level of real time that's required, I guess? Um, not, at, not at this point. We have no, no knobs exposed to the, the end user environment. Uh, it, is a, it is a great idea, but um, again, you, you think about our environment, it, it makes it difficult because another thing that we were tweaking is um, what code to actually generate, which instructions to generate on, on Intel. We're running on uh, uh, Mozilla, IE, um, Opera, we're running on the Intel architectures, everything from a Pentium 3, Pentium 4, Pentium M, all the way up. And um, we also have PowerPC, many variants of OS X. So having the code customized based on the processor would squeeze out our size budget um, tremendously. And also the complexity of the code would increase substantially. So trying to find the right middle ground, um, you know, without allowing user tuning has 
been the way that we first attacked this. And, and you have to remember, this, this has just been released uh, this summer. So Flash Player 9 has just gone out. This is the first time we've put a, a just-in-time compiler in our system. So there's still definitely things to be learned from this. Um, but right now, that's, that's the balance we have. Um, so I've got this slide that you may squint your eyes at. I didn't release this out in the package that I sent out simply because I didn't have a, a chance to contact the, the owner for permission to do so. So um, I, I left it in here just so you can get an idea. But what this is is something that some statistics, performance statistics that this gentleman had uh, rigged up and done some analysis. And it matches very well with some internal statistics that we have. In the center are timings on the latest AVM, the uh, player 9, which is the AVM 2 inside of it. And then the next to that are flash player 8 timings, which is the previous version without the JIT. And you can see the performance increase is pretty substantial. I mean, uh, a lot of that is attributable to the JIT. Um, but a fair amount is it just redesigning the bytecode, simply having a faster interpreter, a leaner interpreter, um, separating verification phases, uh, and, and you see some of the, the performance increase, anywhere from 80% all the way to 290-something times for an empty loop. Oh, 25. That, that should be zero if it's empty, right? We should have compiled it right out to no code at all. I don't know why we're... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there, there's a bug, so we have to... <laughs> but anyway, it's, you know, you're looking uh, around an order of magnitude anyway easily in some cases and in other cases not. Um, what about for uh, full applications? Uh, great intro to the next slide. <laughs> There's a, an email that we got. I don't know if you can read it again, sorry, but um, what this is basically showing is a full application, not quite a, an application that one would think of, but it's a, a CSS parser, so a style sheet parsing code written in ActionScript 2 and the individual had uh, got hold of our beta code and um, our beta release, recompiled it to our new bytecode and ran it in that engine and saw a 12 time boost just from that without even um, giving us any of the hints that we could use and, and the hints being type annotations and things like that. So he, he just took the raw code, recompiled and bang, saw 12 time. So um, there's a lot of um, early buzz in, in kind of this developers arena for ActionScript 3 and Flash Player 9, which is very exciting to, to see. Yep. So how do you divide up your CPU budget between executing user code and doing compilations and maybe figuring out that some things need more compilation than others? Better yeah. register out there, that kind of stuff. Excellent question. Um, we've taken a very simplistic approach. So one way is we could actually augment um, the the code and monitor how, how many times a particular method is getting executed. And there's all sorts of ag algorithms for, for sort of determining these things. Um, the current algorithm we have in place, which seems to work very well for our code, is if we determine that a method is going to get called more than, more than a single time, we actually JIT it. And the JIT is fast enough that um, this doesn't prove any problem at this point right now. So it seems to be working now, but that's definitely an area that we'd like to to do some more research in and, and play around with it more. Um, and this is where you guys come in, actually. Um, as we were developing the AVM2, we did it at a time, and then again, an unreadable slide, but we, we developed the AVM2 at a time when um, Mozilla and Netscape have their JavaScript uh, machine uh, in place, and they're looking to kind of take it to the next level also in terms of performance. So we worked very closely with, uh, with those folks to make sure that our engine would be compatible with anything that they wanted to come out with or, or even could be introduced um, at some point, some later point, into their, their product. And that's exactly what happened. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, we announced that we're, we've released it to open source. So the code is available for anyone to play with. This is the full VM with the garbage collector, with the just-in-time compiler, everything. Um, so all the code's out there. It is, we're working with Mozilla to integrate it in the next version of Netscape. So it's gonna be in the ver next version of the Netscape browser. 
and uh, it, it's there to, to play as you see fit. I mean, if you wanted, what would be wonderful is if someone in, in, uh, in research could pick it up and start playing with it and, and kind of tweaking these knobs and then telling us what you found out. Uh, that, that would be fantastic. <laughs> and again, getting back to some of the research that's going on, a lot of what we've done is uh, a not, maybe not a direct product, but a byproduct of a lot of the stuff that happens here at Stanford. Uh, there's a lot of great research going on, some wonderful papers being written. I've just pointed out a couple here, and, and two of them are actually uh, written by Stanford in the <coughs> computer lab here. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, you know, the stuff, you're, you, the stuff you're, you're working on, the things that you're, the research topics you're thinking about, uh, um, the ideas that you're coming out with, it all kind of gets mixed into the same churn eventually. And, and is propagated out into ideas and in products and, and things like that. So um, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And if there are any other questions, then sure. Well, a lot of it seems like the push would make the flash a lot more rich. The, the, the encouragement to write a fairly demanding uh, multimedia application. So is it even worth thinking about the multi-core implementation? The what? About multi-core um, um, right now? And I know you're leaving a lot on the table already. Right. One answer is just run faster on one box. Well, there is definitely uh, a lot of activity going on with multi-core um, within the company. Right, because I know about all this stuff that's being worked on under the Photoshop and things like that. Right, right. And there, there is, um, the, well, there's the, the graphics end of it. So there, there are graphic processors, GPUs, that we're making extensive use of, um, and we will be making extensive use of in, in upcoming releases. And that's just purely on the graphics front. On the, on the multi-core front, um, we're still trying to figure out the right thing to do um, in terms of VM-wise, where, where to lay it. Um, lay it down. I mean, if you look at some of the earlier work done with um, Intel and their threading cores, that remained fairly transparent to the rest of the operating system. You really didn't get a handle on it. Um, but if you look at some of the, the, and even some of the newer multi-core stuff too, I mean, you can basically just step back and let the processor handle it and decide what to do with it. Um, so we're trying to figure out whether we should actually start taking control of some of the cores and how to partition them because you can look at it as, well, processor technology, and I'm sure you've heard some, some talks about this too, that processor technology is definitely the mainstream stuff is moving the multi-core designs. So expectations of having more cores in each processor and uh, how to partition that, the, the workload and what to do with them, I think is still in my mind anyway, at least that I'm aware of, still an open issue. And it's not been addressed by the software industry. It's almost like the hardware industry is saying, okay, here, here are the parts, go figure out what to do with them. Um, as someone who uh, tends towards paranoia about computer security, uh, can you uh, make me feel any better by telling me what you can't do with this, uh, with ActionScript? <laughs> <laughs> like, can I, uh, can I say that it will be confined to rendering only within its window. Can I say that it can't access the file system? Can, a few other things. Can I say that it can't talk to the network? Those yeah. are things that, I, that would make me feel a lot better. Yeah, we, we actually, um, there is a, a lot of work going on in security right now, and especially um, with the recent findings of um, uh, the recent holes and leaks in, in some of the IE browsers and things like that. Um, and even within the player, there's been a couple of fairly high profile uh, findings within probably last spring time frame that we had to patch. Yeah, so we've had to patch in, in certain places. Um, Those are implementation errors as distinct from design errors. Oh, sorry, yes, you are correct. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> you know, how to get designed well is only the first step. Right, right. So uh, there's, yeah, I mean, we have, we have a team dedicated just for security. I'll, I'll put it that way. And this team does um, code reviews. They're involved in our design reviews. They do post-pass after the implementation to walk through the code. We also have um, a number of software systems that run, um, that generate 
bad code that generate all these conditions and we pump them through the, mm -hmm. the system constantly. So there, there is a lot of effort going on. For Those that. are again a, such a uh, test suite can only find errors in implementation. Right, right. Uh, JavaScript uh, is famously vague as to what the scope of a global <laughs> variable is. Right. Uh, how do I, if I'm designing a, a JavaScript application, how do I know who can step on my global variables? Okay. You don't find that in the manual. Right, right. So we, it, the, the language itself doesn't have definitions for that. Now if you use ActionScript and you run in the Flash Player, we have a security model that wraps around ActionScript. So we have sandboxes, for example. And the sandboxes, by default, are completely self-contained. So if you're running code in one of the sandbox and somebody else loads some code, you can't even you don't even know that there's other code running. It's completely isolated. And that kind of permeates all through the, the flash runtime, the player, uh, access to any resources is that way. It's very, very restricted. So, thank you. Do you have any um, way of controlling CPU usage? Like if you have two flash things and they're both trying to consume all the CPU, do you have anything that caps one over the other? Sort of what sort of balances between the two? Um, or, or yeah, denial of service very attacks very are, are difficult. We, we, uh, we don't really have anything that can hammer those right now. Um, there are some limits for certain things. So stack overflows, um, runs on, on certain types of operations we can capture. But in general, uh, they're very difficult to, to cap. Yeah, this so even cooperatively, the two applications can't be friendly to one another and say, I'm willing to, to be nice and only use 60% of the CPU if you're willing to be nice and only try and use 60%? We don't have a way of, of um, no. managing the CPU usage at this point. Sorry. Um, <coughs> so you mentioned that you went a little bit over size budget. Um, how, mu how much machine code is in the AVM2? How much? How, how many kilobytes of machine code are in AVM2? Like, what did you add to the Flash Player 8 in order to get this? Oh, we're, we're about uh, 250K for, for the whole... Um, AVM, and that doesn't include the GC, but the GC is actually not that big. But that includes all of our system library, the just-in-time compiler, the interpreter, um, and sort of the, the runtime APIs are all associated with that too. So as an independent system, if you go to this, uh, the Tamarin build, and you were to download and build it, put a shell on it, you'd see somewhere under 300K for the whole thing. So. I have a piece of code that wants to run all the time. Mm -hmm. When does it ever get stopped? If we're if we're looking at a different tab, or if we're uh, if we've got that browser minimized, right. is it still trying to run? Um, there are criteria for it. It it will continue to run in certain cases. In other cases, it won't won't run. So depending on um, what the application is like, but uh, there are restrictions within the Flash Player. Uh, about when you minimize and something's in the background, what happens with it, yes. Have you done any human interface studies regarding exactly how long people are willing to wait on the load time? So can you, for instance, just muck with your compiler until you're right up to that border? Um, we haven't done it to that degree, uh, that I know of anyway. I mean, there may be a group within the company that's done that, but uh, we didn't explicitly do that when we built, built the virtual machine, but it is a, it is a very interesting point. I think this is going to have to be the last question. Just, I think we're well, out of time. related to that, um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you go to, so I guess is, is YouTube or what, a, that's a flash? Yeah. So how much of the time when you click on the thing you're waiting, how much of it is compilation versus the data loading, um, the, uh, the content loading? For, for something like video, it's, it's very, it's immediate. There's, there's actually a feature within the player that is just streaming the video. So there's no, there's so probably very the little code. Da waiting for data now. Typically, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what I've seen, there are cases where you wait for compilation, but almost never. I mean, the, the applications have to be extremely large. We don't see delays. Like in a, a typical, that complex application I showed you early on in this slide, with all those windows and everything else, that typically comes up in a snap, you know, and, and is executing. So. If you want to take maybe just one or two more questions, you okay. can come until at 5.35. Sure, if we still have time. I was wondering if you had any meaningful comparisons with existing SpiderMonkey or Rhino implementations in terms of performance or, or any other areas. Um, the earlier reference that I had up there actually had a full chart across the board with Rhino. Uh, 
So if you want to take a look at the numbers there, um, there are cases with um, spider monkey where there are certain instances where we're actually slower. And I haven't had a chance to figure out why yet. <laughs> we need to look at them. Um, but in general, though, you see a speed up across the board. And um, the interesting thing is that, uh, again, Brendan Eich, who, who's running um, the, who's the lead for the spider monkey engine, which is inside Mozilla, um, is working very closely with us. And it's, um, you know, as stated in the goals, it's their intention to take our technology um, and migrate it into the spider monkey system. So he's fully on board and convinced that this is the, the right way to go, is to take that compilation technology. So meaning that he's very comfortable with the performance of it. What about, the, what about Rhino? Is it, I was wondering if there's any me, me, interesting comparison since Java has its own JIT, for example. Yeah, that, that would be an interesting thing. Um, the numbers that I've seen out of Rhino tends to be slower than SpiderMonkey, though. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm looking at the latest data, but that's typically what I've seen. So my assumption is that if Rhino, which is a Java implementation of um, uh, SpiderMonkey in a sense, so it's the, the JavaScript engine, but somebody's written the, the runtime portion in Java as opposed to C. SpiderMonkey's written in C, for, for those that aren't aware. Um, so the, the Rhino implementation I'm, that I'm aware of, all the numbers are actually slower than SpiderMonkey, and that implies that if we're faster than SpiderMonkey, then we're, we're faster than Rhino. But I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen any concrete numbers comparing, the, comparing us directly with Rhino. But it would be interesting. Um, okay. Final um, question? Average, um, like, like how big are, you know, most most of the flash things that people are actually using how how big are they how much code is there so how much do you have to actually worry about the optimizations and stuff mm -hmm. um lines of code type of thing or, I guess so, or just what how whatever is meaningful to you in terms of size or complexity trying to, or, trying to think of a metric uh, the majority of code that we find out at least on the web is relatively small so you know you're on the order of thousands of lines of codes maybe tens of thousands of lines um what we're finding is happening, which is really interesting. In the enterprise, people are using Flash to build a lot of very complicated uh, applications, especially things, um, you know, back-ending their old mainframe, for example. So they'll be writing, you know, the old form fillers that they had with HTML pages, and instead they're, you know, writing them in Flash now, a lot of that stuff. So it, you're seeing some pretty heavy applications occurring in, in the enterprise, and those can be... Uh, you know, in the order of hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Our internal product that we have called Flex, which uh, generates, um, I, I'm probably not summarizing it very well, but Flex, which is a, um, an XML-like language that then produces a Flash application and um, contains a lot of support for widgets. So you can build UI elements very easily by writing a description in XML for it. You can tie them together and all sorts of things. Um, that product, I'm not sure how many hundreds of thousands of lines of code, but that was our, a lot of our, proved a lot of our test bed when we ran the, the JIT against it. So, and we were seeing, you know, um, performance that is very comparable with, you know, an interactive app. There was no delay. You know, we'd click on an element, the entire uh, element would be recompiled and you wouldn't even notice. And then you'd see the drop down menu, for example, that kind of thing. So it's highly interactive in that way. Yes. Can you comment on the, your experience in, in uh, releasing this code into open source issues with copyrights, patents, and so on that you ran into? Um, so far, it's been fine. Um, <laughs> it's only been a few months, so um, you know it's all still fresh. We had to uh, we had to apply Mozilla's um, I think three tier licensing on it or or something. I'm I'm not too familiar with the specifics, but. Um, we had to have those licensing requirements on the code, and everything else so far has, has been fairly smooth and seamless, yeah. So that'll be our last question. Okay. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu.
The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.